Um, welcome back. Let me first of all make one sort of final call, which is please use the last opportunity to read, to rate the, the posters that are on display. Uh, we will close the voting procedure at 12.30 uh, sharp, so please use the last occasion to submit your votes for the electronic posters. Uh, now, Vitor Constancio, Vice President of the ECB, will introduce his guests and open the panel discussion, which will be followed by a question and answer session. He will also raise a few polling questions to be answered via the iPad. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry. Uh, so, we start now this uh, panel, uh, more in principle policy oriented, under the shadow of the two uh, good papers we had before uh, and all the subjects that they raised. Uh, and. Uh, whereas uh, the members of the panel are totally free to speak uh, their minds about uh, the subjects they uh, have picked up. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would hope that they will address uh, the general um, assessment that uh, Daryl Duffy had in his paper about the uh, success or partial su success of the uh, regulatory reform that has happened so far, uh, it would be nice to have that, uh, that, uh, that view. And by the way, I will start even before giving the floor to the uh, members of the panel, I will have a question for the audience uh, in the iPad precisely about that general uh, issue, uh, which I think will, will provide a good introduction to the discussion. And then uh, we have discussed a little bit uh, uh, how this will go um, in terms of the uh, aspects that each member of the panel will, uh, will uh, develop. And uh, we very much, I am very much hope that uh, Claudia in the end picked up to speak about issues of uh, the decision making and governance and about uh, the role of microprudential policy uh, uh, in all the uh, changes that we saw in uh, um, uh, financial uh, regulation that uh, Andrew will speak about the change in structure of the system as a result of the competition that banks are getting from non-banks um, entities, in particular those that are now coming in, uh, coming from the digitalized uh, world, and uh, that uh, um, then are there uh, will uh, address uh, uh, the structural issues raised by the paper of uh, Stein and uh, uh, also, I hope, a little bit about the questions of too big to fail and the uh, legislation that has been put in place uh, in different jurisdictions uh, to address uh, that problem. But as I said, they are uh, free to speak uh, to uh, address the subjects that they feel were more relevant for them. But before giving the floor um, uh, to uh, the panel, I uh, then will have the first question. To be expected. <laughs> uh, perhaps there was uh, normality reigns. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, perhaps there was a slight misinterpretation of the first option, which was not to portray the regulatory reforms as uh, 
uh, totally positive uh, that uh, you know they uh, would have addressed and solved the problems that were at stake. That was not the intention of the first option. But okay, uh, to be expected. Um, that, uh, by the way, coincides with the assessment that uh, uh, Daryl made also uh, in his paper and explained at length uh, why he considered uh, that. So. Uh, we have a very good panel, of course. I think uh, uh, all the members dispense uh, uh, any lengthy presentations. Uh, Claudia Bourg is uh, uh, now deputy uh, president of the Bundesbank. Uh, where she is uh, in charge of financial stability, so very appropriately. Andrew uh, Sheng uh, has an extensive uh, curriculum he has been a central banker in Monetary Authority of Hong Kong. He has been chairman of the Securities Commission in Hong Kong. And uh, he is now uh, a distinguished fellow of the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong, and also chief advisor to the Committee of uh, uh, um, Banking Regulatory Reform in China, so among other things. Uh, and uh, there, of course, uh, uh, is now chairman of the uh, uh, New Economic uh, Thinking Institute and uh, uh, a member of the House of Lords and uh, before a very active member uh, as chairman of the uh, uh, British FSA in the um, initial five years of international reform uh, with his uh, active role in the FSB. So these are, I think, the important points to, to highlight. And uh, I give the floor then to Claudia, please. Thank you very much, um, Vitor. Thank you very much for, for having me here to give a few thoughts on financial regulatory um, challenges. Um, and actually, the, um, the question that was just being asked to the audience here was almost exactly the same question as was being asked to um, uh, the FSB members in a, in a workshop we had in, in May this year, so how do you assess the effects of reforms? And um, we had a very interesting discussion there on which I will actually highlight a few things. The FSB has been mentioned a lot um, in, the, in the previous session. And the starting point for the discussion we had there was why well, we initiated a lot of reforms, and Darren mentioned the different dimensions of the, of his, of the FSB reforms. Um, we started these reforms to make the financial system more resilient, to contribute, uh, to ensure its contribution to economic growth. But reforms were started um, with a lot of um, questions, um, open questions. And we've heard about um, Stein talking about the structure of the financial system. How do reforms interact in, in different types of financial systems? What are the cross-border effects um, of financial reforms? Um, how do we talk about the overall effects of reforms? Um, so typically, we have, we have financial um, regulations that target some micro-level um, incentive mechanisms, but how do we make sure that we have the intended outcome at the, at the aggregate level? What are, if we think about this in, in general equilibrium, what are the effects on other parts of the, of, of the economy? So there, there are lots of um, questions that have to be answered by, by policymakers, by, by academics, and the, I don't have an answer to all of these questions, and I only have my, whatever, 10, a little bit of, over 10 minutes here. Um, so what I would like to propose, um, I would like to propose um, a structure that we should give to answering these, these questions, and these, um, this structure then would have to be embedded into policy making at um, different national levels. Um, institutional structures are going to differ, but I think the overall process should be similar across countries, and. Um, I would be interested in, in getting some discussion also on this. Um, so again, why do we need this? Why do I think we need a, a more structured discussion of, of uh, policy effects um, and reform effects? Well, because we, we couldn't test many of the reforms that have been implemented ex ante. So in an, in an ideal world, we would have more time for ex ante impact assessment, but you all know that time has been, has been short. Um, so evaluating what we have done doing, uh, doing causal impact assessments exposed is even more, is even more important. Um, so let me give you a general um, structure of this, of this evaluation process. And it, it has some similarities, actually, 
um, with the way how we conduct monetary policy. So Jun has mentioned the, the similarities between um, regulatory policies slash macroprudential policies and monetary policy making. They're not perfect, they're, they're differences, but if you want to think about this, this uh, structured process I have in mind, um, try to think about it in the way we also tend to think about monetary policy. So one is, um, it seems the natural point, but it's not always clear when you, when you ask um, um, policymakers what exactly are the objectives of reforms, in particular how should you measure whether these objectives have been, have been reached. Um, any of such process has to start with a definition what do we want to achieve. And um, for some reforms we have macroprudential objectives, for some reforms we have microprudential objectives, or we might have other policy areas that interact with our regulatory reforms like consumer protection, competition policy. So I think this should be clear from the beginning um, what do we actually want to achieve. Now, and here comes the difference to monetary policy where over, over I would say, decades of, of work um, going back and forth between policy and academia, we know pretty well what are the, the objectives of the reforms. Of course, this is different for fi financial stability policies where we don't have these these uh, clear, uh, clear targets. Um, so that means we have to define intermediate targets that we want to achieve. Um, and one um, key argument I want to make here is that we also need to give the system sufficient time to adjust to the regulatory reforms. So we, some of the reforms we are talking about have been uh, implemented relatively recently, so it, um, the system, of course, needs time to, um, to adjust. Um, then the third step, giving this, um, uh, the targets, the intermediate targets, is to calibrate instruments um, uh, depending on, on, the, on the specific policy goals we want to achieve. And let me make one point here, this ex ante impact assessment then to be followed by an ex post after we have implemented the reforms, this really has to take the different structural features of countries um, and financial systems into, into account. So this very much aligns with um, the, the point Stein has, has made. So we will have different models, we will have different approaches of how do we want to calibrate instruments, how do we, um, how do we want to set um, uh, some macroprudential policies in, in particular, you know that macroprudential policy is still a, a, a national um, mandate. And then the fourth step will be to, to assess the effects of reforms ex post and um, try to see whether we've achieved the intended objectives, recalibrate if needed, but without compromising obviously on, on resilience. So this whole process of policy evaluation, I, I would argue, can be misleading if we just look at time series indicators um, uh, trending up or down, and if we precisely, like we've discussed, if we don't take the structure of the financial system into, into account. And I would just want to um, give two examples. Um, one is, um, and that's also relating to, to work that we are currently doing um, on deleveraging and capitalization across um, countries. I will, I will show you the details in a second. And the second quick point I want to make is about um, how do we want to interpret t trends in bank profitability. There's intensive discussions about this now. How can we relate this to financial stability? That's an, that's an open question. Um, so let me start just with a few graphs which um, uh, to some extent probably also look familiar to you. Um, one of the issues that we have discussed before is that um, the capitalization here, these are data on European banks. You would also see it for, for global banks. Capitalization of European banks has increased since the crisis, and we all know the difference between um, uh, capital relative to um, uh, unweighted assets and, and weighted assets. Um, the, the increase in the, in the um, capital relative to unweighted assets, the inverse of the leverage ratio, has been um, less pronounced than the increase in, in capital relative to um, weighted assets. So that's, an in, that's one indication that the financial system is more resilient. Um, when you look at Deleveraging, we discussed yesterday, we discussed a lot um, deleveraging trends. We again see that there's an, um, the, the accumulated change of weighted assets has been stronger than for, for unweighted assets. So we have to see, that, of course, how to interpret this in terms of stability depends on the, on the, on the quality of the risk assessments. And then again, this is something we referred to yesterday. Um, we've seen very different degrees of private sector deleveraging. So this is just um, credit to the private sector. And what's interesting about this slide is that the, is that the, the um, trends have been similar before the crisis, um, but um, despite similarity in regulation and regulatory change, the adjustment after the crisis has been much, much different. And what we did in one big um, 
a research project, it's a, it's a co coordinated research project across countries, was to look at, well, what are the drivers of this deleveraging or the, the, the lending of banks? To what extent is it related to, is it related to regulatory change? Um, so that's, uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is the, the International Banking Research Network which brings together researchers from, from central banks and from international organizations to look at microdata. So it's basically the microdata underlying the BIS banking statistics that we're using here. And one interesting finding from this is that um, actually the effects of, of preferential policies, leakages were, were mentioned in the previous se session, are very different across countries, are very different across banks' business models. So there's, there's, there's this one common finding that it depends on whether or not the regulations are binding, not very surprisingly. So there, there's, some, there's some confirmation of, of basic principles that we find here. But other than that, we find a very heterogeneous res response to these prudential policies, also in terms of spillovers. This is why we can't have this one-size-fits-all um, regulatory approach. We, we need to look at the um, specific underlying features of the data. Um, the second quick point I want to make, uh, maybe because it's also very much related to the discussion in, in Germany, but also a discussion we have at the European level, bank profitability. Um, so many observers are concerned about bank profitability, which has uh, uh, tended to decline um, after the crisis. I should say, though, that in particular in, in Germany, uh, there's been a structural um, decline in bank profitability over the past two, two decades at least, and this is, of course, now becoming um, a bit more, more aggravated. What is driving it? Um, actually, lots of, uh, lots of factors, and I think this is something what's, what's often overlooked in the debate. Um, obviously, regulatory reforms um, matter, monetary policy matters. It's not clear in, in which direction. It pretty much depends on the, on, the, on the interest elasticities of banks' activities. And also structural change. So one of the issues that is often overlooked, the, the low productivity that, again, we've discussed yesterday, of course, that has an impact on the profitability of, of banks. So when you take all of that together, it's not so clear that um, and regulation plays the, the most important role, and it might even be that some decline in bank profitability that we are observing is an intended effect of the reforms if it makes the banks um, safer. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, it, it's not so clear how to link bank profitability to regulation. And then the second step, how exactly is bank profitability um, related to risk-taking and financial stability, that's also not entirely clear. I don't have the time to go into the very details, but let me just sum up with, um, with three main um, points. So I think, again, coming to the question that we um, saw on the, um, uh, in, the, in the little um, survey that was done here, um, I think we have to assess the, the um, success of regulatory reforms against um, our ability to, to lower systemic risk um, and to increase um, capital. Uh, we also had a discussion about um, uh, what does it mean for stock and flow adjustment? Obviously, the, the flow adjustment, this is also what you see in the cross-border um, capital flow data. The flow adjustment has been much faster, but I think we have to refocus the discussion on the stock adjustment. We need a structured process for, for um, impact assessments um, precisely to take into account uh, timing of reform, structural changes of the financial system, and the drivers of heterogeneity that we have in the data. And I think maybe one point, I mean, it's, it's very obvious, but it's often overlooked when you, when you look at the regulatory discussions, what's happening in the real economy and how also how are financial structures related to the structure of the, of the real economy. I think this is also an important <coughs> point to bear in mind. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Claudia. I apologize to you because I forgot to mention that uh, uh, Ravi Menon, the uh, chairman of the Singapore Monetary Authority, was also uh, part of this panel, but he uh, had to uh, drop out at the last minute, which means that each member of the panel has a few more minutes, of course, <laughs> for their uh, presentations. Uh, and I forgot to say that uh, before you started, uh, so I will try to compensate you uh, in the discussion, um, uh, and um, I'm sure it will be all right. We have uh, time then for a uh, deeper discussion. So now I give the floor to Andrew, please. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Vito, for your uh, kind invitation to join this very, very prestigious. It's wonderful uh, to be amongst old friends and meet many new friends. Uh, I've been stuck in somewhere out in Asia and um, thinking through what are the problems uh, of the shadow banking in China, which uh, has actually um, you know, forced me to, to think through some of the uh, issues uh, that uh, China is transiting. And so the regulatory challenges that I present do not represent the views of the CBRC, the CSRC, or whoever, any institutions I represent. But I thought uh, the difference between Asians uh, uh, and Westerners is that we always start with an apology. So if there's anything that I criticize or appear to criticize, let me apologize. And um, <laughs> if I am wrong, uh, I may have to commit harakiri, but never mind. <laughs> so um, let me uh, first, I'm a, uh, I grew up in the island of Borneo, which is really still very wild, but I studied in England. And in England, you learn how to praise everybody first before you cut them down to size. And so let me praise what has happened. I think regulation has succeeded very, very well uh, in raising higher capital ratios, defined liquidity standards, pushing uh, TLAC. Uh, there are some corporate governance changes. I totally agree with uh, Charles. Uh, and there is greater you know, attention on conduct. But I think the, uh, it used to be said that Asian regulators overregulate and under-enforce. But this time, the enforcement is mostly on AML, uh, sanctions, uh, busting, uh, et cetera. And so that now that uh, banks who have been trading with some, some place called Iran, and now Iran is an ally, can we get a discount back? <laughs> but anyway, so uh, this is the, this, this, these are issues that we need to be very uh, clear. Now, where regulatory outcomes have flaws, I think uh, uh, Daryl Duffy has done this very well, and you know, the, the previous panel has made a lot of discussions. I want to make several key points. The first one is that I, for one, would never want to be on a bank, never want to be an inter, uh, independent non-executive director, because everything I do, I have to check the regulations. And if I, who had a hand, minor hand, at least in Basel, the two, and of course the IOSCO principles, etc. If I can't understand it, can you imagine some people have problems with this? You know, uh, I read some of the consultation papers, and by the time you cross-check, you know, subsection three, three reference to practice one, reference to certain models, reference to parts of, of Dodd-Frank that has not yet been written, how am I going to write my regulations and my complex processes in this issue? So the result is what has happened, I'm sorry to say this, is that when bankers are being micromanaged almost by regulation, that's how they feel. I'm not saying that they are. And there are huge sanctions on them. But they move to asset management and fintech and startups. They have no such thing. Where are you going to get the talents? The danger of excessive sanctions is that you are shooting the survivors of the crisis. The guys who caused the crisis are retiring somewhere in some very nice place with their, all their bonuses. And none of them went to jail. So you know, this is an issue that we need to be very carefully careful about. The second one, of course, is about operational risks. Now, any of you who have implemented IT systems would know this. To get very complex IT systems to work together, you need to understand very complex rules, very complex standards. And anything that's un understand your system won't work, which is why every stress test and examination of any bank, you would find they don't have integrated systems, they don't have inf in integrated information systems, they have 40, 50 different risk models in their system, and they, they suffer from what we call pilot dial stress. What does that mean? When the pilot sits there with 40, 50 dials, he's looking at a dial, he's not looking at where the plane is heading. And that's when you impose so many risk models into the system, the, the CEO suite is not concentrating on the business model risk. And I think Charles and Hunshin had mentioned this, and I'm going to stress this. The second one, is, of course, is the risk model. 
We have actually moved to an age, and I think Mervyn King's book raised this. If we didn't understand money, we didn't understand finance because we completely took risk models as measurable volatilities when the biggest risk is uncertainty. Right? So, you know, the risk models are too many, too flawed. They can't cope with radical uncertainty arising from changing geopolitics. Brexit is geopolitics. South China Sea is geopolitics. North Korea is, is et cetera, et cetera. All these, together with technology, is changing all this. And at the same time, as we all know, we're worried about secular deflation. And what is secular deflation? Why are we worried about the US raising interest rates? Because if the interest rates are now raised under a situation of near zero interest rates, asset bubbles will deflate. And if real estate bubbles deflate, you're gone. And the reason why you're gone, when we talk about one, two, three, four percent of capital, of risk-based capital, and the real estate market is 250% of GDP, sorry, even 15% of capital is not enough. So get real. There's no such thing as getting rid of too big to fail. They are all too big to fail. Now, having you know, made these controversial statements, let me now go back to uh, Stein's paper, which I really admire because he was a former colleague from the World Bank. But I want to step back a little bit on this issue because finance, to me, is a derivative of the real economy. It has a very complex interactive derivative uh, uh, feedback in fact, in fact with the real sector. And if you don't understand how the real economy is changing, you don't understand how finance is changing because finance is supposed to serve the real sector. And the, the, the whole crisis showed that it wasn't serving the real sector. In fact, the real sector had to pay for the mistakes of finance, right? But in looking at the Chinese financial system reforms, particularly for rising from the shadow banking, I suddenly realized, my God, China is moving in, a, in, in breakneck speed into a new service-driven knowledge economy in which creative destruction is happening. And if that is the case, if we don't understand how the real sector is economy, how can we fix the old finance model? And let me explain this in as simple as possible. Now, Andy Haldane and all the others have always said, finance is actually networks, OK? And if it is a network, look very carefully. We have moved from a hardware economy to a software economy. Roads, ports, airlines, sea, all hardware. And then on top of them, we built the telcos, right? Recently, I went to Spain, and we looked at a business model of a telco. Suddenly I realized, my God, the telco is actually a bank because the telco has a customer and a bank account, not a deposit account at the end of it. The only thing that stops a telco of becoming a bank is regulation. But the telco was complaining that banks sit on us because they move all the, the information through us and they're eating our lunch, right? But hello, suddenly you realize that the rise of Alibaba and Amazon is actually eating the banker's lunch. Now, when I use the word fintech, I don't really mean all these little startups. I really mean the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks. They have a billion customers. The only thing that is stopped, you know, Amazon or all this moving into finance is regulation. In China, the regulator did not stop Alibaba moving into the finance area. And all of a sudden, once you serve multi-markets, Alibaba is an ecosystem that straddles production, distribution, logistics, and by the way, finance. It made it completely convenient for the guy to do this by phone. Now, if you worry about Alibaba, there, there's a company called Tencent, which did not exist 15 years ago which today has 697 million customers, a market cap larger or equal to the size of ICBC, which, as you know, is the largest bank in the world, 
market cap larger than ICBC, with customer base larger than ICBC, right? And 10 times that of the largest bank in Germany. So, you know, if these guys are not eating these guys' lunch, I don't know what is. Because when Amazon.com serves you and eating the retailer's lunch, et cetera, et cetera, and then suddenly, by the way, I can offer you services. And I'm a lifetime, cust lifetime supplier for all your range of services. Amazon.com can offer you 1.8 million women's dresses of different designs and sizes. The largest Walmart mall can't even do this. They'd be lucky to have 10,000. So the, the technology is changing all this in ways that we don't understand. So let me come down to a conclusion. I recently talked to some bankers in, uh, in Singapore, and I said this, and I apologize before I say it. I said, zero interest rates is taking away your lunch. Regulation is squeezing your lunch. FinTech is eating your lunch. And some of you are still out at lunch. <laughs> and the only reason you're out of lunch is because you're protected by the, by the, regula the current regulations. And if the banker's business model is broken, what is the regulation doing? Has the regulation been far-sighted enough to see where we are moving towards. Oops, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. So, very simply, there are five radical uncertainties changing the normal and financial regulation. Number one is geopolitics. Brexit is one of them, I can only say this. Number two, the zero interest rate is conflating not just the business model of banks, but insurance and pension companies and fund managers. Who wants to pay a fund manager or a bank? one to one and a half percent management costs, when the expected return is zero. The only way the fund manager can take, take, earn better than one and a half percent is they're doing leveraged risk. So when my private banker tells me he can lend me five times my US dollar deposit in order to get a four percent return on dollars, I said, the business model is seriously broken. They've transferred the risk to the customer. The third one, is, of course, is deleveraging, right? The regulations are right, but the timing of that regulation is pro-cyclical. The fourth one is fintech and blockchain is making traditional business models obsolete, and creative destruction is happening. So if we go back to the earlier model, what you're really saying is that at the top end, of the software and knowledge economy. That's where the new value is being created. But the creative destruction is happening at the hardware level. And so if you imagine a very simple model in which the whole economy moves over to the new economy, the value destruction of the old economy is a loss for which we have not yet recognized. And we're not able to tax. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a structural issue that we really need to think about. So what are the major questions? Well, as I said, risk versus radical uncertainty. Of course, increasing capital is very important. Essentially, our risk model said our present regulatory system is able to cope with a two-standard deviation move in markets. But hello, they are even in the deepest and most liquid of markets moving five to six to seven standard deviations. So are you surprised that central banks have moved from lender of last resort to also market maker of almost first resort, right? The second one is, what do you really mean by level playing field? We know, you know, Christina Pistor, one of the, I most admire her, because she said the legal theory of finance is that finance is a hierarchy of legal contracts that is highly winner-take-all situations. So the top five banks account for 70% of the business, the top three uh, news networks, you know, for which we get, receive most information, accounts for 80%. Everything is hierarchical. And the more hierarchical they are, the more concentrated they are, the more fragile they are. They become too big to fail. And then thirdly, what is fair value when the discounted value, the, the, the discount rate is zero or negative? We, we are in a mad situation 
whereby the models cannot measure all these situations. So when another mid-sized financial crisis, as Helen and, uh, um, uh, you know, has, has said, when there's a flee into the uh, safe, regional safe assets, how do we get... Actually, I'm less worried about the negative real interest rates of high-quality bonds as to how much the risk spread of emerging markets and triple C paper is going to shoot up very rapidly. So the impact is, is, is like in Hong Kong, where I learned. If you suppress the price of real estate through public housing at below market prices, are you surprised that private markets shoot up ludicrously? In the same way, when zero interest rate for high risk papers, so risk free papers, is now zero or negative, the risk spread of emerging markets shooting up, and the higher the real interest rate on emerging markets, the more they will deflate, and the world is now pushing to a global deflation. So we are now through our, I'm not blaming anybody because it's a systemic problem. This is a mindset issue moving very rapidly. And in a systemic problem, as Claudia says, this is a systemic issue of which not just finance, it's actually the real sector, the mindset sector. Are we tinkering at the margin when, and, and we have a pretense of perfection and pushing the complexity envelope even more and more rather than stepping back and saying, are we headed in the right direction? And certainly in terms of business model, that is a, a really problem. So to, to end up, I agree with Mario when he says we can't harmonize all this stuff. We not, we're not, we really have difficulty coordinating. But at least we should try to align ourselves on where our common interests are. And our common interest is that we're pushing the systems towards greater fragility. And the chances of the world sliding to global secular uh, deflation is increasing. So to sum up, I want to vary Minsky's dictum, which stability creates instability. I, 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 I evolved this by talking to one of the smartest bankers you know, in Asia. And she told me, right, that the managing of micro risk actually creates a macro uncertainty. And I thought that's a variation of uh, uh, Minsky that's very, very useful. So now we really need to align the incentives between central banks, regulators, and the industry to really say we can't do all the reforms that we want to do. We need to give priority of what we need to do is to fix the business models of the industry that is changing very, very rapidly. And therefore, in a situation where bankers are now feeling demoralized, how do we talk to them as equals, as partners, in order to move ahead and concentrate on how to macro-manage rather than micro-manage the emerging uncertainty, I think is the only solution to go. I'm sorry to being too, uh, seem to be too lecturing too much to all you wise people, but then I apologize earlier and I apologize now. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew, for this uh, challenging uh, uh, presentation. Uh, if I may, perhaps too challenging, but uh, we will discuss it, I'm sure, because uh, it was uh, quite provocative in many aspects. And now, Adair, please. <clears throat> thank you, Vitor, and thank you very much for inviting me to what has been an extraordinarily uh, interesting two days in a quite wonderful place to spend time thinking about these important issues. I want to focus primarily on some thoughts provoked by Stein Klaassen's paper, and in particular by his focus on what financial systems do vis-a-vis -vis the real economy, what functions it performs. And I want to suggest that while regulatory reform since the crisis has made really quite a lot of progress in making the financial system itself more resilient, we have not yet addressed the fundamental issue of how much real economy debt the financial system helps generate and what types of debt. Now, what I'm going to say overlaps to a significant extent with what Charles Goodhart said 
earlier, but with a, a slight difference, because Charles started with the words from the confession uh, from the English book of Common Prayer. Uh, we have done those things that we ought not to have done, and we have left undone those things that we ought to have done. Now, I happen to agree with the second part of that statement, but not the first. I think, broadly speaking, the things that we have done were the right things, but there were other things we should do as well. So whether that leaves us in the position of the absolutely opening words of that confession, O oh Lord, we have erred and strayed like lost sheep, I will, I'm not sure. I think we've done somewhat better than that, uh, but there are other things we need to do. I'm actually fairly confident that the financial system is significantly more resilient than it was before 2008. That reflects the significant progress on bank capital and liquidity, which Darrell Duffy talked about in his paper. It reflects the significant process that Darrell also talked about in the arenas of derivatives, counterparty, clearing, etc. And while I agree with uh, Darrell that that creates a potential single point of failure, I think the fact that we have concentrated derivatives clearing in those single points gives us the capacity to set the appropriate capital and the appropriate margin requirements which will deal with that single point of failure risk. As for shadow banking, while we always have to be alert to the dangers created by what is a continually mutating and innovating financial system, and while there are some developments in asset manager roles and practices which we must monitor very carefully, as the BIS has pointed out, I think we should also recognize that in several ways in the advanced economies, though definitely, I have to say, not in China, the specific forms of shadow banking activities which created major risks before 2008 have significantly declined in importance. As we have more tightly regulated the banks, there has been some shift of credit provision to non-bank channels. But that has actually primarily, if you look at the figures, reflected the growth of a form of non-bank credit intermediation, which is the issue of single-name corporate bonds by large corporates, which existed long before the financial innovations of shadow banking, and which in principle could be a stable form of credit intermediation. And conversely, we have seen a dramatic decline in the role of complex structured credit securities, the alphabet soup of CDOs and CDO squares, etc., distributed via complex and opaque distribution chains passing through SIBs and the ABCP market and money market mutual funds and repo in non-standard securities. So a lot of the institutions, contracts, and combinations of activities most implicated in the origins of the 2008 crisis have largely disappeared from the system. So while we must never be complacent because new forms of risk will continually emerge, for now, I think the financial system is more resilient. Ahead of the Brexit vote, I was asked by several people in the international press, if there is Brexit, is there going to be a Lehman's moment? And I argued, I replied that if by a Lehman's moment you mean that process whereby one event produces another in a self-reinforcing domino effect of crisis within the guts of the financial system itself, I was very confident that the answer was no because I think we have a more resilient financial system in itself. But the global economy is not in good shape. It is suffering from inadequate demand and inadequately high inflation. And the fundamental reason for that is that before the crisis, the private financial system created excessive private leverage, with private credit to GDP growing from 50% in 1950 to 170% by 2007. And that left us in a situation where post the crisis, the leverage doesn't go away, it simply moves around the global economy from the private sector to the public sector or from the advanced economies uh, to the Chinese economy, but with total global debt to GDP, as has been pointed out in several reports produced by several authors uh, in this room, total global debt to GDP now higher than ever. 
Now, the, before the crisis, as Schnein uh, sets out, the predominant academic attitude to that growth of private credit as a percent of GDP is that it was one element within beneficial financial deepening. With multiple empirical studies which seem to show positive correlations between private credit to GDP and either growth or welfare or some measure of utility. And with any concerns tending to be focused on those emerging economies where there was a reasonable argument, it seemed, that private credit to GDP was too low. And as Stein points out, this positive assessment was built on an, on an assumption, and I quote from his paper, that financial intermediation is about deposits and other funds passing, being passed from households and then channeled to the corporate sector. And that is indeed, if you look at our economic textbooks and at most until recent academic papers, the standard model of what we say the financial system does. It takes deposits from the household sector and it allocates them as credit to businesses or entrepreneurs, thus allocating credit between alternative capital investment projects. But I have to say that it is, as a description of what banks do in advanced economies, this belongs on the same shelves of the bookshelf, bookshop as Harry Potter. It is a largely fictional account. For as Jorda, Schulerich and Taylor have put it, that standard textbook function of bank credit intermediation constitutes only a minor share of the business of banking today. And the vast majority of bank lending, or in the USA of capital market lending, is devoted to real estate. And with a large proportion of that real estate lending in turn not actually financing actual new capital investment in new houses or commercial real estate, but a competition between people or firms for the ownership of real estate assets that already exist. And it is that reality which I believe lies behind the emerging empirical findings to which Stein's paper refers. The findings from Cicchetti and Karubi and from the OECD last June that there is not a linear and limitless positive relationship between private credit to GDP and growth, but some sort of inverse U function a range over which there is a positive relationship and then a turning point and a negative, fit, negative element. And the findings from several studies that the impact of increasing debt depends crucially on its specific nature. That while an expansion of that iconic textbook private credit to fund capital investment might be beneficial, high levels of housing finance seem in some cases to be harmful. A finding which I suspect actually tells us that it's about real estate. I think many of the studies focus on housing finance because it's the easy thing empirically to get hold of, but that the, a, the implication also applies in relation to commercial real estate. And with the harmful effects of excessive real estate lending arising both from the strong tendency of debt-financed real estate booms to produce serious misallocation of capital, a point which Claudio Borio and others have pointed out in papers at the BIS, and from the pure debt overhang effects, which Atif Mian and Amir Sufi have described, overhang effects which could result from debt-financed housing booms and busts, even if there were actually no new construction at all, but simply a boom in the price of already existing assets. So I believe that our best understanding of the economic impact of financial deepening in particular, in general, and in particular of rising private leverage, is now quite different than before the crisis. There can be too much private leverage and different forms of debt perform different economic functions with different implications for growth and macro stability. But our financial regulation agenda has not caught up with those emerging findings, focusing until now on the narrower issue of how to make the financial system itself more resilient. Thus, for instance, if you look at the guideline for the application of the Basel III counter-cyclical capital buffer, it says that we should apply that buffer if credit growth is progressing faster than its past historic trend. But the implication of that 
is that if credit growth was proceeding at 10% per annum and had always been proceeding at 10% per annum, that continual growth at 10% per annum would be perfectly okay even if nominal GDP was growing at 5% per annum, which, however, would produce a relentless rise in leverage, which would eventually produce some crisis, which would place us in the situation where we are now with a severe debt overhang problem. Now, of course, our biggest macroeconomic problem today is how to escape the debt overhang position in which we are already. And as some of you know, I have some fairly radical points of view on what we should do about that problem. But if our focus for now is what we should do to ensure that we do not in future, and we do not in the first place, create too much debt, I believe that we should put in place an approach to macroprudential regulation combined, if possible, with the sort of tax changes which Barry Eichengreen referred to yesterday, which quite explicitly seeks to limit the total amount of leverage within the economy. And that, I believe, would imply considerably higher bank capital and requirements than we have introduced so far. Charles uh, earlier mentioned the fact that uh, Mark Carney had said that he was very confident that so far the introduction of higher bank capital requirements had not yet produced, and he considered it a good thing, a lower level of credit supply to the real economy. Let me be absolutely blunt. I think we should have an overt aim of producing a less leveraged real economy. But I think we should also, I suggest, seek quite explicitly to influence the broad allocation of credit between economic functions in order to produce a different allocation than that which free market banking systems focusing on private profit maximization will quite rationally choose. And here I want to suggest that the entire fundamental structure of the Basel II and Basel III internal ratings approach to setting risk capital weights is based on a profound intellectual mistake. That approach assumes that risks is best managed by requiring banks themselves to assess the risk of loss, the probability of default and the loss given default, which they privately face. But there is, I believe here, a massive externality problem, a profound disconnect between what seems to be and what is indeed rational for the private banks left to themselves and what is optimal at the level of the whole society and economy. As Steiner's references, and as I have already said, there is an emerging body of evidence that too much housing finance is harmful. And as I've said already, I believe that the more general point is that too much real estate uh, a, uh, financing can be harmful. And there are many studies, for instance, by Claudio Borio, which have pointed out that the real estate credit and asset price cycles is not just part of the story, of financial and macro stability in the modern economy. It is, again and again, pretty much 90% of the story. But seen from the private perspective, real estate lending, a secured claim against an asset which has multiple alternative users, not just seems to be the lowest risk thing to do, but actually is often post facto the lowest risk thing to have done, even if that lending has produced macroeconomic instability. In the UK, through this latest cycle, losses on UK bank loans for residential mortgages have been incredibly low. And almost no one has lost money from investing in a UK retail mortgage-backed security. But the fact is that the boom and then bust in real estate credit and property prices still played a role in the UK in driving our recession. Our central problem is indeed that real estate lending, and in particular residential but also commercial, can be low risk for the banks and even for the banking system in aggregate, even while through the debt overhang and balance sheet recession effects, which Richard Koo described for corporate Japan and which Mian and Sufi described for residential America have harmful effects. In Mian and Sufi's model and in Richard Koo's, the macroeconomic harm of a debt overhang actually derives as much from the borrowers who do pay back their debts, 
but who in order to pay back their debts cut investment and consumption, as from those borrowers who actually default and thus impose losses on the banking system. And it is indeed, in fact, I suggest, theoretically possible to describe a model in which excessive debt extended against existing real estate could produce severe economic harm without producing a single loss on any bank loan or a single loss on any traded credit security. The solvency of individual banks and even the resilience of the total financial system is therefore in itself an insufficient definition of the objectives of macroprudential policy. And socially optimal risk capital weights will not be chosen by banks focused, even if they are rationally focused, on the risks that they privately face. Finally then, what does this specifically imply? Well, specifically, I would suggest that we should not leave the setting of risk weights for real estate lending to private assessments of risk. But that, for instance, I think we should set a minimum capital weight for residential mortgages of, say, 50%, with modeling used to determine whether higher weight rates are required for specifically more risky loans. And, for instance, a minimum capital weight for commercial real estate lending of 100% or higher. Thus increasing the risk weights for real estate lending significantly compared with those which apply for lending in line with our classic textbook definition of banks, which is lending for capital investment in the real economy. Now, these suggestions, these figures, are, of course, only illustrative. And apart from risk weights, there are also other important regulations and levers which Charles Goodhart described. The treatment of mortgages under the net stable funding ratio. And the, there are the issuers of borrower constraints uh, through, for instance, loan-to-value limits, which uh, Hyun uh, talked about earlier. But my specific examples are intended to illustrate an important philosophical shift. We need to focus not just on how to make individual banks or even the whole financial system more resilient. We need to focus also on how much debt the financial system produces and what type of debt. Thank you. Thank you, Adair. And uh, the interventions, both of Andrew and Adair, uh, provide a good uh, background to the next two questions uh, that uh, we will put to the audience. So, second question now. Conduce. Yeah. See. <laughs> ah. Okay. Wow. Yes. Well, if you compare Germany and the US after the Second World War, C uh, may have a justification. Um, for the majority view. Now, the next question will be about uh, uh, the non-bank uh, sector, and uh, Adair talked about uh, uh, monitoring uh, the uh, overall leverage of the system, and for that, this question is then pertinent. <laughs> Quoting the uh, Stein's paper. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, very good. So now we uh, generalize the discussion. We will start uh, with uh, uh, the panel itself, uh, making some remarks or comments on the others' interventions. I will also have two remarks, uh, in particular to the uh, intervention of uh, uh, Andrew. Um, because he also, uh, as others, mentioned the fact that the banks are under pressure, and in his presentation, huge pressure from many sides, and one side being, of course, the uh, low interest rate environment. Uh, I have two, uh, two remarks there. The first is that, of course, the low interest rate environment was not created only by monetary policy, but it comes also from uh, developments on the real side that have determined a big reduction uh, of a, what we can say a real equilibrium interest rate, which has, according to several estimates, become negative both in the US and in the Euro area. Uh, in, in my more recent speech, I reproduce internal uh, estimates uh, from our experts about real equilibrium interest rates in the Euro area and they uh, come out as negative also, and uh, significantly so. So that's one point, but that's not the main point I wanted to make. Uh, because the effect of the expansionary monetary policies that exist in particular uh, in the Euro area is broader on the profitability of banks. It's not just the effect on margins. And I, about margins, I have uh, uh, a later point to make, but it's not only that. There are temporary effects that offset that effect. First, capital gains, because part of our policy have increased asset prices and decreased yields, and we register in the accounts of the banks uh, last year, for the whole year, uh, we registered capital gains that were significant. Also, by helping the recovery, uh, we see that uh, there has been a reduction in impairment costs throughout last year, and there has been also an increase in volumes of credit. And credit was decreasing in the Euro area until mid-2014. And it was as a result of our several policies, uh, credit easing, uh, liquidity provision longer term, and so on, that indeed credit started to increase again, and is increasing. Um, the uh, low environment of interest rates also reduces the cost of funding for banks that use market-based funding, and there are many, particularly in weaker economies. And by our policies, we have reduced and bring to negative territory the whole money market curve up to 12 months. And so uh, the cost of funding for banks has decreased. Uh, well, the, uh, so, Taking all these into consideration, we have uh, well the uh, past, and we have model-based projections that give that at, at least until the end of last year, the overall effect on average on profitability of banks is positive. Uh, part of these effects are temporary, like the capital gains, of course. We know that, so which means that certain type of policies have limits and we are aware of those limits, uh, and cannot go forever or go much further, and we know that. Uh, but that's the reality, and what we are doing, we are doing for other reasons than what happens to the banks. Uh, and uh, uh, that justifies the policy. But even about interest rate margins, let me say that there is something that is partially free in terms of the decisions of the banks, which is their lending rates. They are constrained by uh, the alternative of bond financing, but only for big firms, for SMEs or households, that alternative is not there. So in principle, they were free uh, and could offset 
which we would not like, but they could do it. Uh, why are not they not doing in most countries? Well, it has to do with the structure of banking and the element of overbanking. Compare with what is happening in Sweden. In Sweden, negative rates and interest rates are even lower than in the euro area. The banks in Sweden are having a very nice net interest margin. And they have protected uh, you know, their business because there are very few banks in Sweden. Uh, in the Nordic countries, by the way, because there were mergers across border. Uh, whereas in other countries, well, banks, do, in view of competition, cannot use that. So that's a, a thing. final comment about the new giants that are coming. And I don't deny they are coming. Not the very small peer-to-peer -peer institutions and so on that will not go anywhere, in my view. It will not become a big thing. But the things you mentioned, yes, you are right. But then let me say, if such institutions will go into providing credit and receiving uh, funds from the public, then the whole type of externalities that have the justify regulating banks then will justify to regulate those activities necessarily. Because uh, symmet uh, symmetry of information, uh, adverse selection, everything then will be there. And society will have to be protected the same way that uh, led to the development over history of uh, banking activity. So uh, we have to have that also into perspective. And with this, I give the floor to the members of the panel first, and then uh, your question. So, Claudia, please. Thanks, Vijay. Um, so, from following the discussion we had here, I, I would have two additional questions one could ask to the audience, and I think the answers would be pretty clear. One is about complexity of re regulation. I think most of us would agree that the regulation is extremely complex, and that's creating all incentives for, for regulatory arbitrage, and, and also the, the, the notion that the risk weights we have in the regulation are not reflecting, are not systemic risk weights. I think that's also something which is pretty pretty clear. Now the question is, how do we get from here to there? So we, we, we have this framework now, and we could all wish a different world, but this is where, where we are, and this is where my argument comes in, that we really have to um, have a good process of how to look at what are the negative side effects of the um, regulation we have in place now, and, and that requires very detailed work using microdata, really detecting the, the um, where, where incentives go, go, go off and where we have um, perhaps misaligned incentives and regulatory arbitrage. I think at the same time, we also need a better public debate on what financial stability policies, macroprudential policies are about. Because if you follow, I don't know, I can't follow obviously the discussions in other countries, but if you follow the discussion in Germany, you have a very hard time explaining what we are doing with, with macroprudential policy, with financial stability policies over and above the, the, the standard regulation of, of banks because the response you very often get to the points um, when it comes, for instance, to, to, to real estate finance, people would say, well, look at the German housing market, look at the situation, everything is fine. I mean, we are, you know, the lending terms are, are, are very solid, which, I mean, this is our general assessment right now is that we don't see a deterioration in lending conditions. But we may have to, we, our assessment of the situation may change. We, we may see, uh, see that the price increase is also leading to, to, to credit growth, which could, which could be unsustainable. So that, that may happen, but the general perception is that we are immune against this. And I'm sure there are similar discussions in other countries. We saw the, the slides on, on, on Spain. And uh, I mean, with hindsight, it looks, it should have been clear. Obviously, it wasn't such a clear case to, to the observers at the time. So we need both. We need this detailed process, we need good microdata, we need to look at what are the effects of the reforms, and we need good narratives, let me call it narratives, on why financial stability policies are important. I think otherwise we're not gonna, gonna get there. Um, that, by the way, is also concerned about this, the, the, the regu regulatory risk weights when it comes to real estate. I mean, this is, I think, also the lesson from the UK. It's not enough to target the supply side, but also to have instruments in place for the demand side. And, the borrower side. Um, but I think you would agree on that. Thank you, Claudia. Andrew, do you want well, to uh, 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 I, say I something uh, about the others? No, I, I, I think I want to emphasize that I have gone beyond blaming anybody. It's not a cause or effect issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Low interest rates are actually both a cause and an effect. 
It's actually the interaction um, of you know, maybe excess savings you know, in the world today, maybe insufficient demand, aggregate demand. And this leads up to a low interest environment, especially in the advanced markets. But you notice what is happening. That low interest rate creates huge asset bubbles. Last year, we have already moved slightly beyond that. Last year, peaks in stock markets, peaks in asset uh, real estate markets, you know, peaks in bond market prices. Right? Not yet finished, but that's essentially the game. The, but then what has happened? Effectively, emerging markets are devaluing around this. So <laughs> you know, your real interest rate, uh, the, the, it's not the risk-free real interest rate. It's the actual lending rate factoring into emerging market risks are actually causing the emerging markets to deflate even faster. And so advanced markets, if it's not careful, and because there's no money, I mean, you know, Nick Stern on his environmental report says, if we don't spend $6 trillion a year on climate change, we're going to burn up. It's a huge market failure that we have the huge liquidity washing around the world at almost zero interest rates. We cannot finance climate change, which will all burn up. Now, the, and why is that? And the answer is the risk of any bank to lend into that area, if it factors in all the risk weights, nobody, nobody in the right mind would lend. Right? So we actually have situations now whereby I've discovered everybody's working very hard. Everybody's working 24 hours a day, micromanaging a risk, trying to identify this perfection. But the outcome is completely unsatisfactory. Nobody's happy. And why is that? Brexit is an expression of that unhappiness. Right? You are increasing writing more and more rules as if the law will change behavior. We all know that's the old saying, you cannot legislate good behavior. So why are we still pretending this? Why do we pretend that we can measure this risk when the biggest problem is uncertainty? And if it is uncertainty, how have society in history dealt with uncertainty? The answer is common good. You know, Elena Ostrom, you know, the public good comes from establishing alignment of common objectives versus common threats, right? And so the result is that unless we, you know, even individuals as leaders, as community leaders, try to pass this message, the biggest problem now, today, is climate change. Because, you know, what is Syria? Syria started out as a drought. And then the geopolitics got, got, got complicated, right? And so if we don't appreciate that if we don't deal with these problems that are highly complicated at the real economy level, finance is pretense. We're just playing with the house of cards that won't solve the fundamental problems in the real economy. Now, but if you don't have finance, you can't solve some of the real economy issues. And that, 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 is, the, that is the question that we, we face. You may have some good points there, but I think you run the risk, the real risk, of uh, uh, having too much confidence in human nature. Uh, there, please. I'd like to pick up. Uh, <laughs> that you could have that at alignment of common good and so on. Yeah, very good. Uh, there, please. I'd like to pick up Claudio's point about a careful process for assessing the consequences, including the side effects and maybe the unintended consequences, of the regulation. But I think when we've done that, we I need to identify both what the detailed consequences are, but then we need very detailed reflections which need us to push forward some of our theories about whether those consequences are actually good or bad. Let me take the particular issue which, which Daryl raised, which is the impact of the leverage ratio and the, the, the trading book capital regime on the level of liquidity in certain traded markets. I think the facts are clear that the banks have downscaled their trading activities uh, not only in some non-standard and risky securities, but also in risk-free assets, 
uh, such as government bonds. And I think this is clearly a consequence both of the leverage ratio and of the reforms that we made to the uh, capital required against trading books activity. What I am less convinced is that it is an adverse side effect because I think we need a far deeper reflection than we have in the past about the value of liquidity in liquid traded markets. I think we probably have in liquidity in liquid traded markets yet another inverse U uh, along with private credit as a percent of GDP where there is clearly a value in a certain amount of liquidity in trading uh, but beyond it uh, the self-induced instability may offset the benefits. And I'm not entirely convinced that a reduced liquidity in the repo market in government bonds has significant or really important effects for the transmission of monetary policy. I think in the transmission of monetary policy, as we think about whether it works today, there are always two steps in the transmission of monetary policy. One is whether when the central bank changes the policy interest rate, is there a somewhat pervasive and somewhat pari passu movement in all the other interest rates and all the other different contracts uh, in the economy. The second key point in the transmission of monetary policy is if there is such a pervasive, uh, or as Jeremy Stein calls it, getting into all the cracks and somewhat pari passu movement in all those interest rates, what is the response of the real economy is consumption and investment in the real economy actually elastic to further movements downwards in interest rates? I think if we face a problem with the effectiveness of monetary policy close to the zero lower bound, our problems are 90% or 95% or 99% to do with the latter, the interest rate elasticity of response of the real economy, and only to a very minor extent uh, the degree to which changes in the policy rate are getting through to contracts relevant for the real economy. As we have reduced uh, the interest rates, the big reductions, of course, are sometime in the past, the fact is there was a feed through to real economy uh, contracts, both on the deposit side, on bond side, on a uh, lending side uh, as well. Uh, when the ECB introduced its latest round of quantitative easing uh, in March, German bond yields came down from 20 basis points to 10 basis points. It strikes me that the transmission to the yield structure is quite effective, both of standard monetary policy and unconventional, but our problem rather is that I don't know a single major German corporate which faced with a reduction of 10 basis points in an already low rate of interest is gonna rush out and start investing. So I accept that there might theoretically be certain problems arising from a lack of liquidity in the transmission mechanisms of monetary policy, but I think they are minor compared with the fundamental issue of the transmission of mechanism of monetary policy, which is the interest rate elasticity of investment and consumption in the real economy. Yeah, there is nothing else, though. Um, uh, so, net now, me oh, sorry. I will compensate you by giving you the floor again for the two end intervention. Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's a very quick Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, which is related exactly to what we just dis 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 discussed. What I hear from our markets people is also that as banks are withdrawing from market making, there, there are other firms going in and there, maybe we don't have them in our data. So I think to get a, get a full picture, I think it would be interesting to look also at those developments. 